Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is Pastor Steve Green, my wife Penny and I, pastor here at Breton Word of Faith Church. Today is Sunday, October 1st. Now, in the in-person service in Breton this week, it is not going to be me. I'll be absent from church this Sunday. It's going to be Pastor T.J. Green from Edmonton. I'm going to be in Living Truth Church in Indianapolis. And the message that I'll be sharing there in Indianapolis is the same one that I wish to share with you today. So the online version of our October 1st church is going to be different than what is happening with the in-person church. We encourage you, if you can, to uh, attend the in-person church with our special speaker, T.J. Green. The title of our message for today is A Trail of Blood. The purpose is just like a connect the dot picture, the kind that we perhaps used to do as kids. We want to connect the key scriptures in the letter of Hebrews to reveal the picture that's in that book. And we can say right up front what the picture is going to be. The picture is a picture of Jesus, <laughs> which is probably not surprising. Um, in particular, it is going to be the picture of Jesus as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, that may sound even, um, that may sound a little complicated, perhaps a little intimidating, but we hope to uh, present um, this ministry, the ministry, the present ministry of Jesus. We're familiar with his earthly ministry. We read about it in the Gospels, but this is his present ministry, what he's doing today, what he's doing to make us holy people and what you and I can do to complement and to cooperate with what he is doing. So the message is about uh, coming to a place of, and I'm going to use a bunch of different words, biblical words, all that either mean identically the same thing or very close to the same thing. So this message uh, is about coming to a place of maturity or being a full age, uh, perfection, holiness would be another word, having a pure heart would be a different way of putting it, being a partaker of the divine nature, uh, Christ being formed in us, all different ways of expressing uh, the same idea from Scripture. Uh, <clears throat> these, All these words are not uh, in themselves are not talking about an action. They're very closely associated with actions, but they are talking about a state of being, a condition of heart. So maturity is a condition of heart, as is perfection, as is holiness, as is um, having a pure heart. These are all heart conditions. So uh, we, what we do, or what we intend to do, or what we intend to explore is what exactly these things are, how we attain to this state of being, and why it is important. So in the end, our conclusion is going to be this. We'll, we'll let you know right off the top, our conclusion is going to be this. Our present tense obedience to the words of Jesus which is what we do by faith, this is an expression of faith, it's yielding to him, gives permission to Jesus as our high priest and mediator of the new covenant uh, to alter in our favor the future course of events in our life. So this is the ministry of Jesus as high priest. He wishes to have an, uh, an intervention in our lives where he is able to alter the course of future events in our lives. To put it uh, plainly, uh, every human being um, naturally uh, has a future course of events that is according to our normal human behaviors. And there's going to be features about this uh, future course of events that are not to our liking. But if we can be righteous with each act of righteousness we do, there's an alteration in these future events. And so the trajectory of our life goes higher and higher. This is what the high priest does. This is a form of, or it's an aspect of salvation in our lives. So beginning in 1 John chapter 1, in verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, and John describes walking in the light as keeping his word, loving our brother, um, practicing righteousness would be all ways of putting it. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. So in accordance with um, uh, our action of faith, um, many actions of faith, each time we listen, each time we obey, uh, <clears throat> there is a cleansing of the blood of Jesus. We're experiencing a certain cleansing 
of the blood of Jesus. Now, the value of that cleansing is our heart is purified, increasingly purified, and then we are more inclined to obey Jesus. So what, what we're saying, it sounds a little awkward at first, is that we obey the Lord um, in order to be cleansed by the blood, <laughs> in order to better obey the Lord. Now that may seem like it's a little awkward, like if we need to be cleansed by the blood in order to obey, how do we obey in the first place? Um, well, we do that simply by faith. We do it not because it's our nature to do it necessarily, but because we do it by faith in the written Word of God. So, um, <clears throat> by, by doing this, we, we, we attain to this state of being. If we, um, <clears throat> I was a little lost in my outline there. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, moving now over, that's First John. We wanted to, to touch very lightly at First John. We're also going to touch lightly a few more verses um, in First Peter before we move on to the book of Hebrews. In First Peter chapter 1 and verse Two, Peter is talking to certain Christians who he calls elect, beginning in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So that, that sounds complicated. Um, it's a little clearer, I think, in the New American Standard. He's speaking of obeying Jesus Christ and being sprinkled with his blood. Um, this is very similar to what we just read in 1 John. 1 John talked about walking, walking in the light, and therefore being cleansed by the blood. Here it's obeying Jesus Christ and being sprinkled with his blood. So that would be the identical same thing, just slightly different wording. And so in this verse, chapter 1 of 1 Peter and verse 2, this is identified as sanctification. So the, the uh, obedience to Jesus, being sprinkled with his blood, blood is uh, accomplishing the the process of sanctification we're becoming sanctified by practicing this day by day so in the new american standard he talks about the sanctifying work of the spirit to obey jesus christ and be sprinkled with his blood so it is by the sprinkling of his blood that we are being sanctified and this coming to a state of sanctification is is what we've been talking about maturity um, full age perfection holiness pure heart they're all different ways of saying the same thing and so we're seeing um, a pattern here about how we come to this this condition of heart this state of being um, <clears throat> the greek word translated sanctification is hagiasmos and it um, is translated uh, it's it occurs ten times in the new testament is translated five times holiness five times sanctification uh, so holiness and sanctification are identically the same thing. Anytime we can take different words, sometimes multiple words like we're doing, and, and understand that they're all talking about the same thing, it greatly simplifies our understanding of the Bible. So a way that we can understand holiness is this, is uh, if we were, I think we can present it very simply by using a fruit tree, let's say an apple tree. Say we have a just a small sapling, maybe just a foot high, 12 inches high. Uh, it's an apple tree. It's it's um, It was planted from seed, it's grown, um, and this would this tree, although completely unable at this point to um, produce fruit, uh, probably one apple would weigh more than the, than the entire tree, um, unable to produce fruit, it doesn't even look like an apple tree. I'm not sure what a, what a small apple tree would even look like. It might look like a hundred other different types of trees, hardly um, distinguishable as an apple tree, but nevertheless, the DNA of that tree is 100% apple tree. It is an apple tree. And so that's what holiness is like. The Bible begins to call us holy right from the point of the new birth. We are a holy people uh, because we have that DNA of holiness in us. We may not be, we may not look holy, we may, we may not be acting holy, and yet we have this identity of holiness. So that's one way um, that the word holy is used. But if we come back to our picture of the apple tree with the, under the right conditions, with the right care and attention, uh, sunshine, rain, uh, 
uh, some time to grow, it comes to be a mature apple tree. And this, ap this mature apple tree now is a picture of what we have been talking about already, this coming to a place of a pure heart or coming to a place of holiness or sanctification or perfection or Christ being formed in us or be becoming a partaker of the divine nature. Now we have more than just the DNA of God, we have the nature of God. It's our inclination, it's, our, uh, it's the way we think, the way we talk, the way we act. Um, we are uh, very much accustomed to and um, conditioned to the practice of righteousness. And, and so the, the picture, the apple tree illustration would be the mature apple tree and it, the, the human um, picture would be that of a heart conditioned for holiness. And then, um, <clears throat> and then the fruit that comes from an apple tree is called apple. The tree is called apple. It's an apple tree. The fruit is called apple. And it's the same with holiness. And so uh, when we come to the heart condition of holiness, then uh, what we naturally do, we have the divine, we're a partaker of the divine nature, is we naturally then produce uh, as an apple tree produces apples, we naturally produce holiness. So in this case, holiness is now not a state of being, it's a way of acting, it's a way of behaving, it's the fruitfulness that comes out of the condition of holiness. So the word apple applies to three different things. The immature tree is an apple tree, the mature tree is an apple tree, and then the fruit that comes from the mature tree is an apple. And in the same way, holiness applies to the immature Christian, it's a description of the mature Christian, the condition of our heart, and then it is also a condition. It is also a description of our behavior that flows out of a heart that is pure or a holy heart. So uh, I think I think that's a clear presentation. Um, <clears throat> so then. Uh, coming to 1 Peter 1 and verse 15, uh, he says, But as he who called you is holy, so God is holy, you also uh, be holy in all your conduct. So clearly this is one of the cases where the word holy is being applied not to our heart condition, but rather it's being applied to the fruit that comes out of our heart condition because he says, Be holy in all of your conduct because it is written, um, Be holy for I am holy. Uh, now moving to verse 22 of 1 Peter 1, since you have purified, and that is the Greek word hagnizo, which uh, comes from the same word that the word holy comes from, to be purified, um, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, so this again sounds like these other verses we've looked at. In 1 John it was by, by walking in the light we are cleansed by the blood. Here it says we are purified by, um, by obeying the truth in sincere love of the brethren. So there's this repetition. And then verse 22 continues, since you have been purified in your souls by obeying um, the truth, uh, now love one another fervently with a pure heart. And so there's that same theological construction again, where we do what is righteous in order to come to a particular heart condition in order that we can do what is righteous. Now, uh, some might say, well, that doesn't quite make sense. Um, uh, but let's give a different illustration now. We've spoken about the apple tree. Let's talk about somebody who is, uh, has accepted a new job and it involves physical work. It involves physical strength. And say, um, I have accepted that job and I'm now showing up for work, but I, my body isn't conditioned to do that work yet. I'm not strong enough. I'm not, um, my muscles are not uh, exercised enough in order to do that job, but I can do it more or less after doing it for one day, I might be very stiff and sore the next day, um, and, and then I, I would just need to push through, do it again, do it another uh, day, do it another day. And in the course of time, I would come to a place, if I was able to persist with this, I would come to a place in time where I was now physically fit, which is not an action in itself, it is a condition of, a, in this case, our body or my body. And now that I'm physically fit, I'm better able to do the work. So I do the work to become physically fit in order that I would do the work. And so spiritually, it is the same thing. So it isn't an awkward construction. It is, it makes a lot of sense. We come to, um, 
to 1 Peter. We're just continuing in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 19. And, and we want to stress this, that it isn't just normal human goodness that is the practice of righteousness. It is something that we do by faith. It is by the power of the Spirit. It is, it is with God's grace. It's a higher standard. So we can see an example here in 1 Peter 2. He says, for this is commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Now on a human level, that's hard to do. <laughs> nobody wants to endure grief. Nobody wants to suffer. And nobody especially wants to suffer wrongfully. In other words, being treated like you've done something wrong when in fact you did everything right. Um, so this, is, this could be extremely aggravating. But here, righteousness is learning to be gracious in this type of circumstance. Not to be alarmed, not to be frightened, not to be angry, but to just be able to trust in the Lord. He says in verse 20, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, this is a different time and place, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us. Now here he's speaking of servants, but Christ suffered for all of us. So this applies to all of us. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. So uh, Christ didn't just suffer for us, but he also suffered as an example for us to follow his steps. It says in verse 22, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But here's a phrase that I absolutely love. Um, it so describes uh, the life of faith. But this is what Jesus did um, when he was going to the cross. He committed himself to him who judges righteously. In other words, he became wholly dependent. He didn't fight. What was We all know the story. He didn't uh, speak up. He didn't argue. He didn't bait, debate. He didn't try to defend himself when he was before the council. He was like a sheep going to the slaughter. He was silent before his shearers. Um, he just allowed himself to be crucified because, not because he was uh, had resigned himself to being a loser, but because he was um, determined to win. And the method of winning was to fully entrust himself to God and let God look after his case. And so he committed himself to him who judges righteously. That's not to say all the time that we do nothing, um, but there are times where there is nothing righteous that we can do um, beyond what we're doing already. So we just continue with that. Um, so this is this is that is probably one of the more challenging um, examples of righteousness. Um, but but it illustrates the point that we're not talking about just normal human beings just trying to be good the way that normal human beings are good. This is not normal human goodness. This is a kind of goodness that comes from faith in God. So righteousness is this higher moral standard. We come to chapter 3 of 1 Peter and verse 8, and he's speaking very similarly here. He says, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning. Now, this is going to be almost word for word what we read back in 1 Peter 2. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Uh, man, again, this is, this is challenging us. This is, this is superhuman. Um, but then that's what faith is. Faith operates by the power of God. It is superhuman. He says, um, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Uh, and so there's a blessing that comes to us, and this is what we're talking about when we talk about salvation in the second aspect. We're not talking about our initial salvation now, uh, but we're talking about the salvation that comes through this process of righteousness that we've been describing. He says in verse 10, 1 Peter 3, For he who would love life and see good days, let him, and then a number of different righteous things. It says here, so the result of um, exercising our faith, listening to the Lord, committing ourselves to him, who judges righteously, doing what he says, the result is that we will love life and see good days. Now, what we're going to see as we go is this is connected to these various verses we've looked at. Um, 1 John 
chapter 1 and verse 7, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, chapter 1 and verse 22, all of which are showing us this relationship of doing righteousness, coming to a, uh, an enhanced heart position, having been purified, being sprinkled with his blood, and therefore being better able now to perform the righteousness that we started doing in the first place. All right, and, and so the result of that is going to be that we will love life and see good days. Now, moving over to Hebrews, and we'll see how, much, how quickly we can move through Hebrews, uh, starting in chapter 1 and verse 9. And now we're going to look at chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and see how in the first five chapters there's the same thought being repeatedly emphasized, and that is how righteousness produces salvation. Again, the kind of salvation we're talking about, loving life, seeing good days. Uh, in chapter 1 and verse 9, we learn about Jesus. Uh, the Father says to him, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Lawlessness is an action. This righteousness is also an action in this verse. And so Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. If in his earthly ministry he loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, then he loves righteousness and he hates lawlessness today. Day. Chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard, speaking of the ministry of Jesus, what he spoke when he was on earth, uh, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels, that's the law of Moses, proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, there was always a consequence to obeying or disobeying the law of Moses. If that's true, then verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. And so he's, he's calling this um, attention to obedience to the words of the Jesus, to the words of Jesus. He's, he's uh, drawing our attention to the fact this produces a form of salvation to us. Later in chapter 2, verses 10 to 11, Jesus is referred to in chapter 10 as the captain of our salvation in verse 11 as the one who sanctifies us or, or makes us holy. Um, so again, we see, uh, we see salvation associated with holiness. Uh, in chapter 3, verse 7, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, meaning hear and do it, uh, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, that this would be the generation that came out of Egypt, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation, the ones who refused to go into the promised land, and said they always go astray in their heart, the heart issue, and they have not known my way, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. So uh, what this is a quotation from Psalm 95. It's being quoted here in Hebrews chapter 3 uh, because it's relevant to uh, the modern day Christian. Uh, he's saying that if we will hear his voice, we will enter his rest. Just like the, uh, the next generation of Israelites, the Joshua generation, they obeyed and they entered his rest, the land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land. So it is the same with us. However, if we do not hear his voice, then just like the, the wilderness generation, we do not enter his rest. This is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. So then we come to chapter 3 and verse 18, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? Verse 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now this is where uh, faith is being defined for us. Faith as it's understood and as it's used in the book of Hebrews. The kind of faith being spoken of throughout the book of Hebrews from beginning to end is the kind of faith that obeys. Faith has different facets, different aspects to it. Uh, one of them is that faith will obey God. If we trust Him, we will do what He says. So here, uh, disobedience is... Um, is associated with unbelief. Chapter 4 and verse 1, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, which is going to come uh, by faith, by obedience, let us fear. Now he's not speaking just about them um, 3,500 years ago, but ourselves. Let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. So it's possible for Christians to, to not be properly obedient and therefore to come short and not experience this form of salvation. Verse 2, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed in, with faith in those who heard heard it, for we 
who have believed do enter that rest. So there is no profit. This promise of, of salvation, you will love life and see good days, a form of salvation, um, this promise uh, will not profit us unless we mix it with faith. In other words, we need to hear the instructions of the Lord, use our faith, do what He says, and then we will enter His rest. Verse 3, for we who have believed, believed in this context is speaking about obedience, we who have believed do enter that rest. So all of this um, is a repetition of the same thought. Uh, a couple of times in chapter 2, a couple of times in chapter 3, he keeps emphasizing that, um, that, that through obedience we enter his rest or we experience salvation. In chapter 5, we find out why he's, he's uh, placing such an emphasis on this. Beginning in chapter 5 and verse 9, he repeats this thought again. And having been perfected, speaking of Jesus, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Again, um, it's this particular type of salvation that he's talking about. Um, called by God, this is speaking of Jesus, the author of eternal salvation. Now verse 10, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. So now what we're going to discover is the reason why the writer is emphasizing this so much to the Hebrew Christians is is because, in fact, they have not been obedient. Generally speaking, they have not been um, uh, doing what Jesus uh, commanded uh, in his earthly ministry, and therefore their hearts are not being sprinkled, they are not being sanctified, they're not being made perfect, they're not uh, partakers of the divine nature, and therefore they are not now participating in this form of salvation. Uh, and so this is a letter of correction, and you and I can profit. We don't have to have this letter written to us <laughs> direct in the sense that it was written to them, but we can read it and, and learn very much from their situation. Uh, so uh, he said, uh, you have become dull of hearing. He says in verse 12, for though by this time, in other words, they've already been saved for some time in the first aspect of salvation, but for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God or the word of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. And so that's the condition that the Hebrews are in. They are unskilled in the word of righteousness, unskilled in doing it. Um, and then he describes such a person as a babe, as a baby Christian. Um, so this now becomes an excellent understanding for us of what perfection means. It's a state of being. It's a condition of heart. Um, it's not referring to a person who does everything exactly right, but it is referring to somebody who whose heart condition is is been changed. It's being sprinkled with blood progressively, and it is changed. It's coming to a place of maturity again, not doing everything right, but nevertheless becoming skilled in the word of righteousness. So we don't need to be afraid of that word perfect. It just means the same thing as um, as being holy or being sanctified um, or um, any of the other ways that we've mentioned of the Bible referring to that being made perfect. So uh, he continues in verse 14, but solid food belongs to those who are a full age. That's the Greek word teleos, translated perfect most of the time. Solid food belongs to those who are a full age. That is those who by reason of use, by becoming skilled in the word of righteousness, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so this is going to be um, the, the, the result of uh, the practice of righteousness is there is going to be um, a cleansing of our heart. There is going to be a development of conscience within us to where we become uh, well able to discern both good and evil. The implication is, is that to begin with, we're not that good at it. <laughs> we might be good at being able to tell very basic things, you shall not murder, but when it comes to more uh, um, nuanced issues, sometimes um, 
we're just unfamiliar with the distinction between right and wrong. Uh, and so then in verse 1 of chapter 6, he says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. So this, this passage that we just read, Hebrews 5, 9 to chapter 6 and verse 1, is, we could say, the theological center of the letter to the Hebrews. Because um, the writer once again states what he's been saying throughout chapters 1 to 5 about the need to obey in order to be saved. Um, and then now he, he sets the stage for the remaining eight chapters. He gives us a preview. He gives us a statement that is just simply going to be um, expounded upon it. Details are going to be added. It's going to be clarified. But it's the statement that, the statement that we read here um, in chapter 5 is simply what's going to be repeated from now till the end of the uh, end of the letter. So we have a preview of what the entire, we have a picture of the entire letter here in just these few verses. So, uh, <clears throat> and, and so then this is going to be descriptive of Jesus as high priest, what he does. So what happens is, is by faith now, we, by faith, and again, not because our nature has been fully adjusted this way, but by faith we simply take what Jesus says and step out to do it. The Holy Spirit joins with us. He helps us to do it. There is some kind of inward change in me that happens. Um, and I be, my senses, my spiritual senses become exercised prior practiced in order to discern both good and evil. Um, and this is uh, where Jesus, it's within this description that Jesus is going to play his role. So we'll see uh, what this looks like. So then, um, what the coming chapters are going to talk about. And today we'll finish here. Um, if we had sufficient time, uh, we would not only give this description we're about to give in our remaining minutes with you today, but we would then go to each, we would go to chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, and demonstrate um, and show and add more detail to everything we're about to say now. But for the moment, what we're going to do is, is simply show, uh, give give a, um, as we said, a preview of everything that is to come and show how it all fits within the context of what we've already read, that being that those who become skilled in the word of righteousness now become exercised by reason of use in order to discern good and evil and how this ability to discern good and evil is salvation for us because the better we can see, the better we can do, and the better we do, the better we experience. So then, in the coming chapters, what we're going to find is this. In chapter 7, we learn that in response to coming to God through him by each action of righteousness, Jesus now intervenes for us in order to alter the course of future events. And so, again, each time we, we simply... Um, uh, yield to God. We um, forgive that person who uh, was did something harmful toward us. We walk in love toward our brother. We commit ourselves to him who judges righteously. Each act of righteousness, um, in the moment that we do it, Jesus is now permitted which is an interesting word. He's now permitted to intervene in our life and he does something. We've read about it already. He sprinkles blood, but he intervenes in our life in such a fashion where he now is able to, um, <clears throat> he's able to uh, alter the course of our future events. And, and the uh, events that are first of all altered are our future behaviors. Um, the, this, act of sanct this act of sprinkling with blood, sanctifying, making us holy means we are, we're going to be increasingly behaving differently so, so events will be affected that way. And then in turn what that is going to do is um, the, the external influences around us will now begin to line up more in our favor in response to um, our actions of righteousness. All right, there's going to be an alteration of future events. This is very supernatural. There's not a natural explanation for it. Uh, we read um, in chapter 8 then that the intervention is in fact the ministry of high priest. So now we get a clear picture of what a high priest does. He's, he's just there um, and he's ready to um, to to 
uh, insert himself into our life circumstances um, and, and to change the way things unfold for our life. Um, it is the more excellent ministry in chapter 8. It's described as it's called the mediation of the new covenant. So intervention and mediation are two words that are referring to the same thing. It's where, where, where Jesus comes between us and God and he facilitates a work from God to us that again brings salvation to us. Uh, the first impact of this mediation that we read in chapter 8 is to write the words of his covenant on our hearts and the more his words are written on this is not something that we just do by reading the bible but as we're engaging in this practice of righteousness god himself is personally writing his words on our heart this is the uh, development of our conscience to where we increasingly discern between good and evil um, there is nothing in the Old Covenant we read that has this effect of perfecting the conscience of the worshiper. It's only New Covenant words as spoken by Jesus uh, and then accompanied by His interventions as we practice these words. These are, this is the only way under the sun that this uh, development of consciousness or conscience can happen. Uh, by The means by which Jesus performs these interventions is by the ongoing application of His blood. This is what we read as we continue through the book of Hebrews. Um, as his blood is progressively applied to our heart, we, we increasingly come to discern good and evil. We, we better serve the living God. And in fact, uh, the way it's described in Hebrews 12 is that we serve him acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So the, right, the actions of righteousness by faith are the means by which we draw near to God and produce the effect of our hearts being sprinkled from an evil conscience. Conscience. So conscience is a function of our heart. It is our heart being sprinkled with blood. So Hebrews chapter 5 verses, um, verse 9 uh, to chapter 6 and verse 1 is the whole letter in a nutshell. It gives clarity and explanation to the first five chapters. It provides the reason the letter is being written. It defines exactly what the problem is. And likewise, it shapes and defines the coming eight chapters. We see the progression from being a sapling to a mature fruit tree. And biblical expressions, again, describing this progression are becoming pure in heart, being sanctified, being made holy, being perfected, Christ being formed in us, being a partaker of the divine nature. So, that we'll choose that as a we'll choose that as a quitting point for today. There is so much more that we could get our teeth into, but this um, I think provides a a good outline for uh, really one of the most basic and um, impactful teachings of the New Testament is, is how to take advantage of the present ministry of Christ as our high priest. Uh, his, his readiness, his willingness, his desire to sprinkle his blood, intervene, change the course of our future events, uh, change the trajectory that our life is on, bring us into a fullness of his experience. Uh, it's called an aspect of salvation. This is the will of God for our lives. Thank you for joining us today.